for our next talk, we have uh, Joseph Morris, who is an associate professor <coughs> here at the University of Vermont in Plant and Soil Sciences. And his talk is called, Do Invasive Earthworms Affect Maple Regeneration? Thank you. So I'm back talking about more earthworm stuff I did here. I guess, uh, <coughs> All right, so I'm not going to talk about nitrogen. I want to talk about phosphorus. We should do that too. But uh, so we we got really interested in uh, some questions that the sugar maple producers have about popcorn. So I've scared them enough to they start asking questions. Uh, and they should probably not be quite as, as worried as, as they are. Uh, but they want to know, you know, what's happened to our, our maple forest? What's happened to the regeneration of of the canopy? Um, and uh, that, those are real questions that uh, Proctor uh, Maple Institute, uh, Research Institute actually gets. Um, this, you know, people calling up, we have these earthworms, and what's happening to, we don't see much regeneration, can anybody get into this? So we started looking into this uh, for the past couple of years. And uh, just to give you a quick background, you all know that all of these, all of these earthworms in, in the month uh, actually, um, Invasive, or I should say it's exotic, most of them are invasive. And you notice, I show this slide every, every year, so uh, oh. 16 a couple of years back, 18 last year, 19 species this year. And it's not that they weren't there, it's we haven't been, been able to look uh, everywhere. And we, there's little things like somebody calls up and says, we have this Perionics excavatus in our, in our worm bin, uh, which is uh, this blue worm or uh, Malaysian blue worm should be here. But anyway, uh, 15 European species, and then four confirmed uh, Asian species. Um, and I'm mainly concerned with the, the very large worms, which are Lumbricus uh, terrestris, which is the common night crawler. And I'm also in, uh, you know, really interested in these, in these three worms. They're all known as crazy snake worm here in Vermont, or they're in other places they're called the jumping worms. So Alabama jumpers, uh, Jersey wrigglers, all those are common names. Uh, and so Alabama, New Jersey has happened for a long period of time. For the South, you go the longer that we've been there. Um, but these are the three that, that we find pretty commonly here in, in Vermont. And so if you haven't seen them yet, they move like snakes, snake worm. And if you handle them roughly, they lose their, their tail. Crazy. So, crazy <laughs> <snake worm. laughs> um, so these. This is the first wave of invasion, so that, that goes hundreds of, years, hundreds of years back. And this is the second wave. Uh, 20, 30 years maybe here in, in Vermont. Uh, it's not quite clear how long they've been here. Um, New York City greenhouses, 50 to 60 years, they've seen them. And then uh, there was some, um, there was a, a, re a researcher in, in Maine that Gates, he's a really famous earthworm <coughs> researcher uh, that was active you know, 40 years ago, and he has documented 40 years ago that in areas where there's a lot of horticulture, there is a lot of these, these uh, Asian earthworms 40 years ago. So that's Maine, so that's not too different to what, what we see here in Vermont in terms of the systems. Um, what is the effect of this? Um, so I, I talked to somebody who's interested in, in uh, invasive plant species and and restoration of forests. Uh, can we have the lights on? Is there a switch there? Is there a switch there? Maybe better. So before before an invasion, so th these are basically the, the solumes types that we find with and without earthworms. Before invasion, you have this really thick layer of uh, OI and, and OE horizon, so commonly known as duff. Uh, it's that really spongy layer that you have a lot of uh, roots that permeate through this. It's a seed bank for a lot of plants. And then when, when the earthworms invade, they basically they turn this into a horizon. So much lower organic material, uh, much denser, much less root penetration through that. Um, and you're going from something like 40% organic material in this horizon to something like 12%, which is incredibly high for the horizon. And then, the, the, so this, this is the university, <laughs> those are the, the European earthworms. And then, uh, once you have the megascolicity, those Asian earthworms come in, then there's an, another change in the, 
uh, and the soil structure basically have this, this, this really granular structure right at the, at the surface. And these are loose granules. So uh, I'm going to take some of those to the erosion lab in, at Purdue uh, next week, and we're going to test how, how erosive this, the erodibility of this of the soil is after the Asian outcomes got a hold of it. So that is great. This is OK. And this is OK, I guess, eventually for, for growing plants in. But you have different plant needs that will develop here. Right? So if you want to, if you want to um, uh, restore restore a plant community, then you may want to think about will they actually will this actually work on, on these soils? Just as an aside, because I had a, a nice stimulating uh, talk uh, conversation at, at lunchtime. So that's what happens. And uh, so what, what is, what is the, the role of that duff layer? Um, it's a seed bank, it's a germination medium, it's good for water retention, uh, nutrient supply because the, the, um, the decomposition occurs in, in that duff layer uh, and plants have extend their roots into that. Uh, and then it shows a rich understory because all of these things are working. When nothums have invaded, then you go from something like that to something like this. So this is, I, I believe, somewhere like a kind of sun. Um, just like that picture. And this is uh, one of the Olympus, so the crazy snake worm invaded forests. And these are all these, these questions that we have, loss of understory by biodiversity. And that has been pretty well documented across the northern tier of the United States and in Canada as well. Uh, lack of regeneration, that's what I hope to uh, show you some, some data on. And then, you know, what, what about erosion during, during timber harvest? You know, how, how, is, how is timber harvest affected by, uh, how, is, how is that soil folding together when you have timber harvest? So quite a few um, foresters have asked me about that. And I can't really say one way or the other until I come back from Purdue. And then invasive plant species also tend to come in uh, after that soil is disturbed. Basically, that you know, uh, create a lateral sort of environment um, and, and there's less, you would imagine, there's, there's less competition for space in the understory. So you, you have uh, garlic mustard in some places uh, coming in. And so the mechanism that people have proposed for um, <coughs> a reduction of regeneration of the, the uh, canopy is, well, first there is that floor, first floor damage. Um, then you have fewer under, understory plants. Along come your, come your ungulates and uh, your uh, deer, etc. and they start browsing. And so they don't find their nice, nice juicy plants anymore and they go for the saplings. And so this is one of the, the uh, mechanisms that's been proposed for, um, for the loss of saplings and less regeneration in, in maple forests. And I just want to show that. So this summer we were at 39 sites, and some of them were uh, sugar maple uh, forests. You can see there's the, there's the, the line, uh, the set line. And some of them are right next to a nursery or right next to a beautiful garden. And so this is a southern, southern Vermont, and there's, there's a nursery or a garden center, and they put their horticultural stuff right into the forest. You know, it's great because you put more organic matter in there, yeah, along with the fluoride. But then just a few, a few uh, meters down the slope from there, you see uh, tree gingivitis, so the roots are exposed. Um, you see bare ground, you see less, less cover in the forest than what, what, you, what, what you would expect. Uh, and this entire area was riddled with these Asian plants. And we've seen that in, in several places. There's a beautiful garden in uh, Fairfax, right on top of the knoll, um, and then all around that maple forest, and a sugar, actually a, a sugar bush that was managed for, uh, for maple syrup. And it was absolutely full of Asian snake moths. Mm -hmm. And then you go, go into the flower beds, and here they are. Uh, anyway, uh, it, it's, it's actually quite difficult to, to describe what this damage is like, the forest floor damage. Um, but the folks in, 
in Minnesota, who deal with invasive earthworms extensively, have come up with this really cool, cool tool called the Invasive Earthworm Rapid Assessment Tool. And it's actually pretty simple. If you see no damage, you have a, you have a, a full, full organic horizon in, uh, in that forest. It's a category one, and category two, there's a slight loss of, of the gut layer, of that moor layer. Um, basically means it's patchy. Um, and then it becomes even more patchy. So number three, you <coughs> see the first signs of earthworms. Earthworms might be pretty rare here, so it's difficult to find them. Most of our field season is in the summer. So we go out in the summer, most of the European earthworms are actually excavating. They're no longer active, so you don't see much of them. Uh, and it's difficult to find them. Uh, but once you get to category two, you actually find earthworms or signs of them. So signs could be castings, middens, um, uh, and, and you have you have lost, uh, quite a bit of a loss of this gut this, uh, layer. Uh, category four, the more layer is absent, and you start seeing middens. Middens are excavation mounds that uh, uh, the terrestrial night, the nightcrawler is, is producing, and uh, you have to have less than 20 within a five meter radius to have a four. And so the difference between a four and a five is that you have more than 20 middens in a five meter radius. And uh, if you go anywhere in the Champlain Valley, um, you probably have been to about 60 sites this summer, you find that sometimes you have 40 middens within a square meter. Yeah. So it's really quite destructive uh, features. And um, for Aminthus, we, we had to, so Aminthus is not really taken care of in the scheme until, until uh, up to, actually taken care of until up to here. But after that, so the really heavy damage classes, there's no criterion for Aminthus. And so we had to, man, had to change that. If you see an extensive layer of those, this granular coffee ground type stuff, then we made that a four or five, depending how extensive and how thick that layer was. So this summer, we're actually interested in looking at uh, different frost hardening, hardening zones and what happens there. We, we, go from, we went from the one down to Connecticut. Uh, I didn't do Connecticut, actually. A uh, technician did that for us. And so we're covering anywhere between three and, um, and six uh, frost hardening zones. And there's, we saw quite a bit of difference. And some difference I cannot explain, so I'm not going to go into that too much, but I'm going to show you some data for Vermont. Um, and uh, so we have we had two sampling um, years, 2015 with 18 uh, sites, and then uh, 39 sites in, in 2016. Um, so some things we measured, earthworm species, this invasive earthworm um, damage class, percent cover, and we did that in one meter square uh, plots. And so this is what we see. This is the, the damage class from one to five. And uh, you notice, so this, the, the blue, so, up, so from zero to 100%, the blue is, is no earthworm, uh, is no earthworms. The red is the Olympics terrestrials, and the green is uh, the, sorry, the red is the, uh, the Asian worm, and uh, the nightcrawler <coughs> is, is the green. So most of this is, you know, in, in Vermont, most of it is, is the night crawler, but some of it is already, some of these, this damage class is already the uh, Amethyst worm. Um, so some of the reasons why we see no earthworms from sometimes, all this is below, even though we have a damage class, simply because this was a drought and we don't, we really didn't see many earthworms. So we can't say, well, there's earthworms there, because we, we did find the, the signs of earthworms. So if you go from, from uh, zone, so go to zone four, five, and six. Uh, you see in, in four, uh, we have only a Memphis in the five. Uh, then you go to six. Again, it's either no, uh, no earthworms or just a Memphis. So this is Connecticut. Connecticut is really riddled with this Memphis already. Um, one minute, I'll talk really fast. Um, so plant cover. So if you're looking at a Memphis, address this or the emitted species versus the non-common nightcrawler versus no earthworms. Um, we're finding that, that uh, the average number of, of species is really low, actually significantly different from, from the other two. Um, for the cover, same thing. 
And Maru, you wanted to talk about this. So this is regeneration of uh, saplings, maple saplings. Really low for Amicus agrestis, um, come nightcrawler, higher. And then uh, there's no worms, and we have you know, up to six, seven saplings per, per, uh, per, per plant. And I stopped there because my time is up. Show the picture of snow cover. Do you think that influences the population? Yeah, also things uh, influence the population of, uh, of the other ones. I've been collecting cocoons. Um, I think I have a picture of cocoons somewhere. So here's cocoons. These are desiccated cocoons in the winter time. Uh, frost. Uh, the way they survive is they the, the water. Um, and so, yeah, under under snow cover, we frequently find that some of these. Um, these cocoons are split open, so they, they come out already. So it's kind of warmer in the winter time under the snow cover. Uh, but by the time the snow cover goes into mud season, uh, all these little creatures are dead. But if if climate change continues, I think that some of them might survive, and then we have, rather than having annual worms, we have these worms that persist throughout the year, not as individuals, but as, as a population. So it, it, it does make a difference. And from year to year, we find uh, somewhere between 120 to 200 of worms at the peak. And so that might have to do with snow cover. So, can you tell what the what an average depth of the layer would have been before the worms arrived on this continent? Uh, good question. So there, there are some places where you can go and you can find the zone. Anywhere above 1,500 feet, you actually find quite a few places that have not been invaded. And uh, so there you, you can actually measure the thickness. In the Adirondacks, that old e horizon can be like 10, 20 centimeters thick. That uh, that layer with, with the roots of duck layer. Eight inches. Pardon? Eight inches. Yeah. Yeah, yeah up to eight inches. Uh, now it's not. I don't know if anyone's looking for any biological control for these worms. Um, good question. So, uh, yes. So, we don't we don't really have any any rules about these earthworms, right? Um, I'll find the picture. So, we found some interesting things. Um, one place where there is a rule is in Wisconsin, and uh, they are looking for controls and for best management practices for for nurseries, and they got some money for it. So this year we found this kind of one. This is an Asian platform, it's a juvenile. Uh, and you notice it has a really red head and there's these little globules in there. Uh, those globules are full of uh, parasites. Um, and you know, we wonder whether, I mean, they're full of parasites anyway, but these particular parasites are encapsulated in these, in these sheets. Uh, and we wonder whether, you know, that's but it's going to kill these worms. And so it seems to have some effect, but we don't want to you know, culture them and then spray them everywhere because who knows what else is going to Thanks. <laughs>